This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Casper, a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. Get $50 off select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code galaxy at checkout. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 297 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Daniel Ellsberg. In 1971, while working as an analyst for the Rand Corporation, he leaked the Pentagon Papers, which revealed that the U.S. government had been lying to the American people for decades about the Vietnam War, and those revelations helped bring the war to an end. That story is told in the acclaimed new movie, The Post, starring Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep. Anz will be speaking with Daniel Ellsberg today about his new book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, in which he reveals that in the 60s he was responsible for drawing up America's plans for nuclear war with the Soviet Union and China, and in which he also exposes the deranged thinking and total lack of safeguards that have characterized America's nuclear war planning for generations. And today's show is brought to you by Casper. If you need a new mattress, just head on over to casper.com slash galaxy and order today. The mattress industry is famous for forcing consumers to pay high markups, but Casper cuts out the cost of resellers and showrooms and passes that savings directly on to the consumer. Your Casper mattress will be shipped to you in a small box, and all you have to do is open up the box and watch as the mattress naturally expands to its full size. Casper's mattresses are designed by humans for humans. The original Casper mattress combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. I've been sleeping on a Casper mattress for over a year, and let me tell you it's the perfect mattress for curling up with a book like The Doomsday Machine. To give you an idea of how comfortable this mattress is, just let me say that I was still able to fall asleep even after reading this book. So just head on over to casper.com slash galaxy and order today. You have 100 days to try out the mattress, and if you decide not to keep it, Casper will give you a full refund. Free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada. Terms and conditions apply. And remember that you can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code galaxy at checkout. All right, so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with Daniel Ellsberg. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so just before we started recording, you were telling me that you have a, a little science fiction uh, uh, bit of trivia you wanted to mention? Simply that when Leo Szilard first had the idea of a chain reaction that could cause uh, amount to an atomic bomb, he really had the idea years earlier from H.G. Wells' science fiction. Uh, not the War of the Worlds, actually, but an earlier book whose name escapes me at the moment about an atomic bomb uh, war. This was before there was any physical real basis for that. As a matter of fact, he had just heard from a top scientist that any notion of actually getting practical energy from uh, the nucleus of an atom, releasing that energy, was sheer moonshine. And that was a challenge to him. And uh, thinking back of H.G. Wells' thing, it occurred to him at a certain moment, he even remembers that it was stepping into a street after a red light, that if the nucleus of a heavy atom in splitting should release more than one neutron, it could lead exponentially to a chain reaction that would be an explosion. He patented that idea, and he chose the Admiralty to hold the patent because he felt it was a, should be a military secret. This was in 1933, and he didn't want the Germans to have that idea. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because you mentioned in the book in passing that um, before the Manhattan Project, the idea of uh, of a nuclear bomb was really only known to a very small number of people, including science fiction fans. Um, and there, there's this famous uh, incident where uh, one of the, uh, I think it was Astounding Science Fiction magazine published a story about a nuclear weapon, and they were actually investigated by the FBI because um, they were wondering if a uh, word had leaked out about the Manhattan Project. Um, and that, yes. was, that wasn't the case. It was just, you know, people in the science fiction world, that was the kind of thoughts that they were having. Actually, when Zillard realized after uh, it was discovered in Germany that uh, the uranium atom could fission, and that, and he had discovered by his own experiments that more than one neutron was released, uh, his first reaction was, the world is in for a lot of grief. And he saw that as something that would uh, be very ominous for humanity. But in any case, 
Uh, almost very few articles were written about it during the war, especially from 42 on, but a few did get through based on uh, articles and data that had come out before this voluntary and other secrecy set in, uh, in 39, 38, 39, 40. And my teacher at school happened to read an article that had talked about a U-235 bomb, a possible bomb that would be 1,000 times more powerful and explosive yield than the largest blockbusters of World War II. And each such article was investigated by the FBI on the belief that it must have leaked from the Manhattan Project, but it never had. In, in each case, it had just um, come about from using uh, pre-war material. Yeah. Now, that's really interesting. And I mean, speaking of science fiction movies, one science fiction movie that I really wanted to ask you about that you talk about a lot in the book is Dr. Strangelove. Could you just talk about what it was like watching that for the first time? Well, I'm not sure I would call that a science fiction uh, article. It was a satire, but uh, it was based on Herman Kahn's work to a large extent, also the thinking, if you can call it that, thinking as it was, of Edward Teller, uh, another Hungarian who was the father of the H-bomb. Uh, Werner von Braun, Nazi scientist, engineer who was turned to use on American missiles, and Henry Kissinger, a German-Jewish emigre who had worked on uh, nuclear strategy mostly from the outside. Anyway, uh, parts of all those were incorporated in the figure of Dr. Strangelove in Kubrick's movie. And uh, the notion, uh, and it wasn't set uh, far in the future. It was meant to be, I think, around the same time as it came out, 1964. And indeed, uh, the reality was that everything in that film existed as an operational reality at the time. Things that people found very unrealistically imaginative, like the possibility that planes once sent off by the president with a go order, as in the movie, could not be brought back by the president, that he didn't have a code to bring them back. Uh, if he changed his mind, if it would found to be an accident or if the other side surrendered, or if, as in this case, it turned out to be a rogue general who had set off the planes. Well, the reality was that a rogue general could have, or less than a general, could have set off the planes, as was done in the movie, uh, with an authentic order at his level. And moreover, once that was done, no one in the system had a stop code. There was no authenticated way to say this is really the authority and you should you must come back. Uh, there, that didn't exist at virtually any level, uh, amazing as that seemed. Also, in the movie, there was the existence of a doomsday machine, which was Herman Kahn's concept uh, expressed at Rand when he was a colleague of mine, of a system that would on various provocations, such as uh, nuclear explosions on our own countries, but possibly something much less, would annihilate all life on Earth, or all human life on Earth. And Herman's belief at the time was that that did not exist and never would, because it would be elaborate enough to require a lot of reflection and debate and controversy, and in the end would never seem justified. Why have a system that would destroy life, uh, all life on Earth. For what purpose? You didn't need that, and it was obviously dangerous to humanity. Well, Herman was wrong. Uh, it did exist uh, right at that time, and it was called the Strategic Air Command, uh, along with an increasing number of submarines, Polaris, which eventually joined with SAC to become the Strategic Command. And uh, all of those, both our planes, our missiles, our our uh, submarine launch missiles, at that time, if they followed their actual plans and they did what they were supposed to do under wartime contingency, would in fact have destroyed nearly all human life because the smoke that they would generate from burning cities that would be lofted into the stratosphere would kill virtually all the harvests in the world and uh, starve nearly everyone in the world, but there would still be a small fraction living on fish and mollusks in New Zealand and Australia, but pretty close to the notion, uh, close enough to be called doomsday. 
Well, so you mentioned that Dr. Strangelove is a satire, and it has obviously a point of view that all of this stuff is completely crazy. And you knew a lot of these generals and high officials. Did they watch Dr. Strangelove? Did they, how did they react to it? Did they see themselves in these crazy characters? That's a very interesting question, which I've never heard raised. Uh, I've read a lot of the reviews of Dr. Strangelove and essays on it, and I haven't seen that question. Have you, by the way? I think you just thought that up. <laughs> uh, yeah, Have you no, ever seen I, it? I, I've never um, heard anyone ask the question no, to someone. No, it's a very good question. Now, I can say that as a civilian consultant in the Pentagon in 64, uh, I and my boss, Harry Rowan, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, later a close friend of mine who was later president of RAND, we took time off uh, thinking we weren't taking a vacation. This was a businessman's holiday to go see Dr. Strangelove about what we were doing about our nuclear war planning on the afternoon in uh, Washington. And I remember coming out of that movie in bright sunlight in the afternoon and looking at each other and we both agreed that was a documentary. And moreover, we could pretty well recognize uh, seem some of the types, not just Dr. Strangelove, who we know from Harry, Henry Kissinger and Herman Kahn. Some of the Kahn's words are actually quoted uh, in the movie. But and Kahn himself, by the way, I read later, uh, wanted a cut. He thought he should get some royalties from this, <laughs> and Kubrick had to assure him that wasn't the way it it worked. <laughs> um, I'm not sure why it isn't the way it worked. I noticed that in the movie, The Post, some of my words are, are taken from my book uh, in a scene that I'm in with McNamara. So the scene is very accurate, uh, but it, it, it's exactly from my book. And as we speak, it occurs to me that if I were Herman Kahn, I would be asking for some royalties, but I wouldn't get any anyway. <laughs> so uh, we recognized those people. We also recognized the military uh, to a certain degree, you know, the not... Uh, some of it was meant to be like Curtis LeMay, but uh, not physically, not in terms of his actual characteristics. But in terms of this kind, kind of wild, flyboy, cowboy aspect, uh, not un unrecognizable from Air Force officers we'd met, some Air Force officers. And uh, anyway, uh, the question you asked is a very interesting one. How did the people in the Pentagon, they were the uniformed people, actually react to this. I can tell you one thing. They didn't change their plans or any of their operations. Uh, when when Ronald Reagan, president, saw the day after, in I think the early, it was in the early 80s, it might have been in 83, uh, he said to have been so depressed by it, about a nuclear war, uh, effects on the U.S., as shown on television, uh, that he stayed in bed most of the day uh, the next, which is uh, rather an appropriate reaction. And actually, in his case, did lead to his, his decision to discuss with uh, Gorbachev an actual possibility of eliminating nuclear weapons. It was a factor in his mind. Well, they didn't do that. They were held in line by their subordinates, uh, in particular on the U.S. side, people like Richard Richard Pearl and Douglas Feith, I believe, and, and even George Shultz uh, uh, cooperated in saying, no, he must insist on testing SDI, Star Wars, which, by the way, <laughs> was always said to uh, possibly to have attracted him, Star Wars, Strategic Defense Initiative, because he had been in a movie uh, much earlier in which scientists had developed uh, an actual kind of envelope over the country, a bubble that would protect against uh, weapons and missiles, a quite infeasible project, which was fiction, which was a dramatic fiction, but that Reagan, almost alone in the government, took it seriously as a possibility in his SDI, because he'd been in this movie, and movies had great influence on him. So uh, I think what this all adds up to, though, is it is time for another Dr. Strangelove, or at least a revival of it, and I would be very interested in the reactions in the Pentagon to, to a, a viewing of that movie. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but um, there were actually a group of science fiction authors. I know uh, Jerry Pornell was one of them who were advising Reagan on the SDI. Um, that's very controversial within the science fiction community, but uh, yeah, there was some, some of that uh, influence going on. Yeah, well, the actually, Russian scientists were also uh, early, earlier than ours, possibly, 
in uh, investigating nuclear winter, the effects of smoke in the stratosphere globally on weather, climate, producing a new ice age and reducing. And Gorbachev has definitely said that was in his mind from his Russian scientists in these same discussions with uh, with Reagan. Reagan also, uh, as a couple times, have mentioned that he was aware of the nuclear winter. But we're talking now not of science fiction, but of scientists getting ahead of the curve there and uh, saying, interestingly, by the way, the, the first idea of nuclear winter came from uh, the son, Walter Alvarez, the son of Louis Alvarez, somebody that I knew actually from a task force I was on in, in the Pentagon, uh, Louis Alvarez. And the two of them investigated what might have caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And uh, they conjectured that it was an asteroid hitting the Earth, I think at Yucatan or um, Central America, that caused so much dust and uh, smoke and fires in the atmosphere, along with a lot of volcanic activity around that time, that blotted out the sunlight, killed the vegetation, and killed off everything larger than a raccoon, including all the dinosaurs. And that had the effect of allowing uh, little mammals, the size of chipmunks, I guess, to evolve into chimpanzees and humans and others, and to uh, make possible a man-made asteroid, in effect, that would have the same effect. Well, I mean, there are a lot of science fiction movies. There, it's, it's the post-apocalyptic genre where you see what life is like after the nuclear war, like Mad Max or something. But it seems from reading your book that those dr uh, dramatically understate how bad things would be. Um, you know, they would be even that, worse that's than that. Uh, that's true. Mad Max is... Um, I haven't seen all the movies, but uh, in a kind of desert-like environment, isn't it, with... Um, with food, uh, they have a, a water problem, but uh, is it made clear uh, how they eat? I'm not sure. They, there's a valley in one of those movies where there seems to be a lot of water and food and so forth. But th the point is, I think that nearly everybody would be uh, killed off by the starvation. And what you would see are not people roaming around on super motorcycles, <laughs> but uh, some people on the edges of water in the southern hemisphere eating fish and mollusks. Uh, but I mean, how long would the fish? I mean, without the sunlight, uh, with the yeah, fish... there's a fish problem also. It'd be deeper, deeper levels of the ocean. I I don't know enough about that. It's uh, not too soon for people to be investigating that. I guess could happen any day. Yeah, I mean, one thing I I listened to some interviews with you, and one thing that struck me is that I mean, everyone I know, all the experts say that the two biggest threats facing human civilization are nuclear weapons and climate change. Yes. And so you would think that people would be interested in getting the message out about those things. But you said that this book was turned down by 17 publishers who said that there was no interest in nuclear war among the public. Well, that's a, a, a commercial and a, a matter of the public uh, reading. Now, Trump has, I guess I, I have to thank Trump for the readership here. I would <laughs> I would very honestly uh, do without that cause. Um but he has scared people to the reality of a nuclear threat remaining, including involving the U.S. and not just by a terrorist. First use by the U.S. seems possible, as we have threatened for all of 70 years of the nuclear era. But people aren't aware of that, that uh, starting a nuclear war is something that all presidents have regarded as an option. And even if some of them couldn't imagine themselves doing it, possibly wrongly, but couldn't imagine it, they were well aware that for political reasons and alliance reasons, they had to pretend they were willing to initiate nuclear war, as in NATO and elsewhere, and buy the weapons for it. And I think the, the pressure for that pretense came from the fact that uh, purchasing those weapons by the government, or giving them to our allies, or selling them, is very profitable some, for some very powerful corporations. Uh, I myself neglected this aspect of things for the whole time I worked on it. I never heard it talked about, whatever. We sort of had the thought that the people who were supplying these weapons for our deterrence and for our needs, like Boeing and Lockheed and Raytheon and Grumman, uh, Northrop, were kind of public servants, that they were, you know, almost, as we thought of it, like pro bono, responding to this need by the government, you know, to protect ourselves. Uh, increasingly, I don't think that was the way it was. 
I think if these things had not been profitable and also uh, associated with jobs in almost every constituency in the country, state constituency, uh, votes, profits, union uh, membership, the unions have supported this on the whole until perhaps quite recently, uh, campaign contributions, uh, all of this is embedded in a system of money, actually, and jobs and careers that um, keeps it going, even when, in periods when there don't seem to be any rationale for it all, as uh, when the Cold War suddenly, unforeseeably evaporated uh, for a few years. And nevertheless, the, the money went on. And uh, I think if it wasn't there, we wouldn't have these maintain these doomsday machines, which have never been morally justifiable or served any real military purpose. Well, one of the lines from the book that has really stuck with me is you quote Herbert, Herbert York as saying, how many nuclear weapons are needed to deter an adversary rational enough to be deterred? Somewhere between one and a hundred, closer to one than a hundred. And... Yes, I'm glad you picked that out, and, and most people haven't. Uh, I thought of that as one of the most important statements. Herbert York was the first director of Livermore Lab, working meant to work by Edward Teller on H-bombs in competition with Los Alamos. And uh, then he was the first, or one of the first, directors of research and engineering under Eisenhower in the Defense Department. And that's he said exactly what you said, that the, need, the number needed to deter a nuclear attack by anyone rational enough to be deterred is somewhere between one, ten, or a hundred, and closer to one than a hundred. Now, that's that's pretty compelling. When you really ask people, you know, what does it take to compel, they will often come up with one, or ten, or something like that. And what that implies is that from that point alone, from deterring nuclear attack by a relatively rational opponent, every no nation has a justification for having more weapons than North Korea has right now, 10 to 20. They're said to have as much enough material for perhaps as much as 60, but the Federation of American Scientists estimates that they have between 10 and 20. Well, that would fit in with uh, York's estimate, which I think is a very compelling estimate of a uh, necessity for deterring nuclear attack. By rational. Although I have to say, the 10 or 20 they have is not clearly deterring <laughs> nuclear attack. What does one say about that uh, by by Trump? Uh, uh, he's not a rational actor. Yes. Uh, the premise there was a rash, an actor rational enough to be deterred. Now, we don't know yet. Honestly, this is not a joke. We don't know whether Trump is so mad as actually to carry out an attack, non-nuclear or nuclear against North Korea. He's acting as if he is, and he said that he is, and his, his uh, officials like H.R. Uh, McMaster have implied that he is. That could be a bluff. Uh, presidents and the secretary generals of the Communist Party have bluffed in the past. Khrushchev, for example, made threats that he simply didn't have the weapons to carry out. They didn't exist at that time, quite aside from the risks of carrying out such threats, even if he had them. But there have been times when people have made threats that they just weren't able to do. Now, we're certainly able to carry out our threats to annihilate North Korea. And for that matter, Kim has the capability to carry out threats against South Korea to annihilate them and much of Japan. Uh, it's a question whether he has the ability to cause casualties in the U.S. right now. Rand did a study in the year they first tested a nuclear weapon, 2006, of their ability to send a nuclear weapon to San Francisco Harbor or Los Angeles Harbor by boat. They have plenty of boats. Uh, they've long had plenty of material to send. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a fully weaponized uh, warhead. It can be just a nuclear device to set off in a boat at Long Beach and cause hundreds of thousands of deaths by radioactivity within a week or two. Now, that's a capability they certainly have. Uh, but their effort to get an ICBM and be more obvious and open about their ability to threaten the U.S. immediately in 30 minutes rather than 30 days or something uh, is, is obviously dangerous for them. And the question is, how dangerous, which is to say, how likely it is it 
that Trump would be so mad, so insane, as to actually carry out his threats and start a war that would lead to millions of dead within a day or a week. More violence than the world has ever seen in that period of time. Could he be that mad? Well, a lot of people don't find that hard to imagine. And yet, I, I just want to point out, uh, he, he hasn't strictly uh, uh, done anything like that uh, in his life or in, the, uh, uh, in this year. So uh, it's not certain. Uh, to the extent that he is acting on a madman theory, which Richard Nixon described, acting mad enough to make threats of mad action credible. He's only foot, walking in the footsteps of virtually every president. They've all done that. So making mad threats and preparing to carry them out is nothing new. It didn't start with Trump, and it won't stop with Trump either by himself. Uh, what's new is that he's doing it so openly, uh, more than more than his process, as to scare people, and conceivably that will scare them into taking some some kind of action to to rein him in. That hasn't happened yet. Well, so I want to underline this point because I don't think that I really appreciated this until I read your book. But I, I like I think most people was under the impression that both the U.S. and Russia launching missiles at each other would destroy the world. But you say in the book, even a completely successful first strike by one or the other would be more than enough to cause nuclear winter and destroy all life on Earth effectively. So even the best case scenario is still everyone on Earth dies. That's right. The, uh, it's, it's very useful, I think, to see the trillion and a half dollars we're about to spend on rebuilding the doomsday machine, but which is mainly spent on first strike weapons intended to hit Russian intercontinental ballistic missiles, which are vulnerable to us, just as ours are to them, or their command and control, or their uh, other forces in general, including submarines in port, by the way, and uh, anti, uh, anti-submarine uh, submarines, warfare submarines. All of that is intended for a first strike, which will have exactly the same effect as a second strike, which is that nearly everyone will die, assuming that hundreds of targets are near cities and burn the cities, and that's almost certainly true for the larger options. So it doesn't make any difference whether you go first or second, and these supposed damage-limiting weapons by in preemption, striking second first, as they say in the Pentagon, getting the drop, uh, being first and being best and having an edge and all that sort of thing, more accurate and so forth counts for nothing in the actual effect. It will save no lives in the course of a year or two as people starve to death. Uh, it will have, have no effect. So in the book, you quote Khrushchev as, as being very critical of his military advisors, saying that they would rather uh, let the whole world be destroyed than to be seen as weak or having backed down. And that made me wonder, I mean, reading this book, these are all, all male environments. You know, there are no women in these decision-making roles. And I, I wonder if there was more of a gender balance. Would, would these policies of, of so ca- being so cavalier so. about destroying the world? Look, in the largest sense, of course, uh, most violence in the world is done by men, is a gendered phenomenon. Uh, not entirely, obviously. But uh, to an overwhelming degree, uh, violence against women is done by men, but violence against men is done by men. Uh, the exceptions are, are proportionately very small. And in the war has been a, a male pursuit almost exclusively, despite the fact that some women are, are capable of uh, doing any of these jobs, and they, they some want them. But I do think that uh, those are not exactly, those are women, and they're not alone, but they are not representative of the, uh, the majority of women. That's true of our politicians as well. Um, the, the women who get into these policy-making jobs in areas that are dominated by men, which is to say this entire, well, most corporate life, but especially the national security field, tend to be relatively macho women or, you know, more representative of the ordinary man than most women are. And I think that to change that, it, it's not enough to get a few women in um, – uh, highly high policy jobs. Even Hillary Clinton uh, based her political career 
on being tougher and more hawkish than uh, many of the men around her. Uh, not obviously in a personal sense, but in the sense of being willing to give the generals uh, anything they wanted. Basically, that was a major aspect of her political stance. And I think that won't change uh, until we get a lot of women in uh, Congress and in in the executive branch and in these conceivably in these corporations. So frankly, they will always be be pointed toward profit. And uh, you have to have this general change in the willingness to base our foreign policy on threats of violence and mass murder, genocide, destroying the earth. Uh, it, when I put it in those terms, it would seem, obviously, that's just simply an outrageous basis for policy. But it has been our basis in terms of threats and preparations. Uh, and as you say, I, uh, as you suggest, I believe that gender has a lot to do with it. And that's one thing that makes me very happy to see that 390 women have been provoked by Trump into running for Congress right now. And if we can totally change the composition of Congress and with women who take on this issue and see it as a woman's issue, namely preserving the web of life, the continuity of life, the preservation of our species, I do think there's a, a bigger chance of that with women on the whole than with men. Yeah. Okay. So you, I, I think this, what, the information you lay out in this book is, I think, shocking and frightening and, to my mind, pretty incontrovertible. And I would think that anyone who read this book would have to take this very, very seriously, especially people in government. Have you heard from people in government that they're, they're taking these, this information seriously? I haven't heard anything uh, back directly and don't really expect to. Uh, I don't think that's the way it works in a way. But uh, I would love it if this book were uh, in the hands of people in the Pentagon. You know, when I say that, you're talking about people who are really embedded in a web of relationships that makes them hard, very hard for them to change the system or the policy. But people, let's say in Congress, who in principle not in practice in the last 10, 20, and 30 years and more, but in principle have control of these matters through the budget and through policy. Uh, they haven't had inquiries. They could. They've never investigated this, and that's, that's true of Democrats as well as Republicans. I think the prospect would be much greater of having hearings on this with uh, uh, Democrats in office, uh, it would be no guarantee, but with the current Republican Party, I see very little hope of it. Um, I, I've heard a, an odd thing just recently. My publisher said that it's not easy to do what I urge them to do and send this to simply every member of Congress. It seems that since the anthrax scare, uh, it takes a long time to get a book into the hands of a congressperson. It's a lot of inspection. So there has to be some way of getting it to them face to face by people they trust. And I was talking with my wife just this morning about some people we know who might be in a position to uh, get this first in the hands of somebody like Senator Markey, who has been good on this subject all along. Uh, I would hope he would, he would read it and would encourage him to do more than he has done in the past. He's done some useful things in the way of getting nine other senators to send letters to Obama and now to Trump, getting them to stop funding intercontinental ballistic missiles to go for a, a new first use policy to stop the air launch cruise missile to cut down on the defense budget generally all very good proposals but apparently very hard to get 11 names uh, rather than 10 on that letter in senate and if my book would uh, would increase the number of names on that letter i would i would think that was very successful well, up to a point. <laughs> I have to say, being realistic here, making it 20 instead of 10 uh, would, would be, I'd make me glad something had happened. Would it change matters? Uh, no, actually it wouldn't. Uh, you know, just increasing to that extent is not going to make a difference. And uh, to oppose the legislative power of the donors like uh, Boeing and Lockheed and the others, the campaign donations, the lobbying in general, is very hard. It's even unlikely. And I'm saying that it's unlikely that this species will survive these creations. It's unlikely that civilization will survive 
civilization or a science or, or male-dominated structures and so forth. Unlikely, but not impossible. And, you know, science fiction, as I understand it, and I've never been a great consumer of that, but uh, it's clearly, uh, uh, except in movies, I tend to like, but it clearly imagines both dystopian futures, but also that things might be better and that there's a different way of doing things. And we need that sense of alternate realities because the current reality we're living in dynamically uh, is is not long for this world, I believe. Do you think that that might change, the, the political dynamics might change as millennials become a bigger proportion of the voting public? Because I think people my age and younger have no real visceral uh, feel, you know, uh, fear of uh, the Soviet Union and are much more concerned about uh, or, um, nuclear bombs getting into the hands of terrorists or well, uh, accidental launch yeah. or something like that. Yeah. First of all, I would like to hear that this, the, Russia, the young people do not perceive Russia as an enemy of the United States because I can't see it. Uh, I don't see Russia as not communist, as not an ideological foe of the U.S. now, nor do I see it as expansionist in the way that threatens the real security or concerns of the U.S. Like any other capitalist rival, there are, ca there are rivalries among corporations and rivalries to our own corporations in various ways or our own uh, financial control. Of this place or that, uh, I don't see them as a very uh, threatening one, even to our interests. You know, we're, we're so much more wealthy and uh, powerful on the whole. So the new Cold War that's being spread by, and, and I do have to say, people like Hillary Clinton, whom I strongly supported uh, in this last election against Trump, uh, but at the same time, uh, had a very great flaw, in my view, just uh, which I had to which I thought was overwhelmed by other considerations, but it was not small. And that was that she, like many people in the Democratic Party and Republican, were promoting, in fact, a new Cold War of seeing Russia as an actual, quote, enemy, as in a war or a Cold War. Uh, it's hard even for me to rationalize that, except for the fact, because of the, the very evident desire uh, not only of Yeltsin, whom we supported in a variety of ways, but of Putin in his first 10 years or so of wanting to collaborate and be a partner, or at least be recognized as a, uh, as a respectable nation by the U.S. unsuccessfully. And uh, why, why were we expanding NATO uh, to the borders of Russia? I may seem like a one-note person here, but it's a note that you don't hear enough. I think a major purpose of that was to sell weapons to the Eastern European countries. Instead of their getting their weapons from Russia, they should get them from us in NATO. And I think I've been told by people who are close to the process that that was a major purpose of putting, say, Poland and the Baltics into NATO right on the borders of Russia. A uh, very provocative uh, act, protested at every step of the way, and earlier promised not to happen by uh, Clinton and George H.W. Bush, but which did happen, I think, largely to sell weapons. And uh, again, on the um, overall arms race, uh, I want to say, by the way, not to say it's all the U.S. fault, I think Putin is subject to similar uh, uh, pressures inside Russia to have a state buy weapons from arms producers in Russia. Same, same incentives that our military industrial complex. Uh, long ago, E.P. Thompson, a former communist who left the party, he said that uh, it's misleading really to say, or from, from his point of view, that the U.S. and Soviet Union had military industrial complexes. He said, more accurate to say, they are military industrial complexes. And that is very obviously true right now uh, in terms of the influence on our policies in these areas. Well, okay, well, last point. One thing to be said for Trump uh, in his campaign, which led some people to, uh, that I know, friends of mine, to support him, was that for whatever reason, he did not propose a Cold War with Russia or a hot war. 
Hillary went to the point of actually proposing a no-fly zone in Syria that would almost surely have brought us into armed conflict with Russians in Syria, and again uh, in Ukraine, and here are Ukraine policies. Well, we didn't get any great, uh, for whatever reason, Trump was saying on the contrary, why can't we be friendly with Russia? And that was the one thing that would make me say, okay, yes, yes, right, why not? Why indeed? Not because they're great, but because they're not that they're not worse than Saudi Arabia or China, with whom we do immense amounts of trade and uh, policies and so forth. They're not more tyrannical than uh, Egypt, for example, or uh, Turkey uh, at this point, member of NATO. Uh, why can't we deal with them on the same basis? Now, why is he saying that? Well, I suspect, actually, it's because they do have heavy blackmail on him of various kinds, that they have helped him out financially, his family, in various money laundering schemes, and that keeps him from joining the Cold War chorus. Well, frankly, on that point, I would much rather have that be the case than, um, than be at war with Russia, which threatens life on Earth. But... Uh, for our, for the bargain of these people who said, okay, we'd rather have Trump. Of course, we are verging on war in Syria right now with uh, Russia and for that matter with Turkey itself, it seems, uh, in various ways. And of course, the North Korean crisis we're getting with Trump, which it's hard for me to believe we would have with Hillary or practically anyone else. I, why it's specifically Trump is hard to say. But what you said earlier on, machismo does seem to play a role in that. Uh, you know, whose button is bigger? And, uh, that's something a little hard to imagine a woman saying. <laughs> okay, so no, I, I take that back. It's not hard to imagine a woman who has climbed to the top of the greasy pole, as Disraeli put it, when he became prime minister as a Jew. Uh, no, a woman who gets to the peak of power can talk about her her button being bigger than the other other persons. I'm I'm sorry to say, but not not your representative woman. That's why I want to have a lot more women in government. Yeah. Okay. So we're almost out of time, and I did want to ask you. Uh, this book has a blurb from Edward Snowden, and getting back to the millennials a little bit, I saw a poll today that um, um, a majority of millennials have a positive impression of Edward Snowden. So do you see a scenario where in I don't know ten or twenty years that he comes back to the U.S. and runs for Senate like Chelsea Manning is doing right now? Well, that would imply not just the passage of time, but the total erosion of the influence of the intelligence community. I think they are so resentful of him uh, and of, uh, really of Chelsea, but in particular of Snowden, who uh, revealed their, the strongest secrets of the uh, intelligence community. I'm not talking about code-breaking systems here now. I'm talking about surveillance of American citizens of a, of a criminal nature and an unconstitutional nature. And he revealed that. I don't think he will ever be able to come back so long as they have major influence that they will veto any presidential or other instinct to uh, bury the past and to, to let him come back. So I think he's in lifetime exile. If the world changed in such a way that he could come back to the United States Nothing would make me happier. It would mean a major change in our society. But in terms of uh, applauding what he did, uh, then I'm very happy to hear I'm an honorary millennial here. He's a, he's a, at 86. He's a hero of mine, uh, as well as a friend. And uh, I, I visited him in Moscow. And I haven't been able to meet Chelsea now, but she's uh, yet out of prison. But uh, again, uh, she's a definite hero of mine, and I look forward to meeting her. So that's that's very good that they feel that way, in my opinion. But it will take action. And if they combine that, by the way, as might well happen from experience, with a total cynicism about uh, or a rejection of any kind of political activity, um, uh, if, if, for example, it led them to demonstrations, but did not, or to occupations like Occupy, but did not lead them to take part in electing these women who are running for office, electing not just women, but women who will vote against the arms race and against first use of nuclear weapons and against these things, unless they're willing to change that, their feelings won't make much difference. 
I'm sorry to say. So <laughs> I, I said, you know, uh, I don't want them to be totally cynical. At the same time, I'm very mindful of Lily Tomlin's line, no matter how cynical you become, it's never enough to keep up. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, it's, it's very hard to put a limit to uh, how cynical it's right to be, except to keep open in your mind the thought that it is not proven impossible. And it's not impossible. The change will come and it will be helped along, uh, however long it takes, by political activity in the streets, in civil disobedience, uh, in protest, but also in lobbying and electoral activity, the way that right-wing youth took over the Republican Party after Goldwater's defeat in 64, and uh, 16 years later had Reagan as uh, their presidential candidate. They patiently worked in a way that the left has almost never done by just rejecting uh, electoral, especially two-party, I mean, party electoral activity uh, at all, and, and thus has let the other party prevail. Uh, I think the, the moral here is, yes, there are two terrible parties in the U.S. They're both terrible. One is even more terrible than the other, in my opinion. And uh, Paul, Paul Krugman's column this morning in the New York Times, I think, is very apt. He's talking on economic policies. And he says that a sense of balance has kept um, the media in general from saying forthrightly that of the two terrible parties, the Republicans are even worse. And that's the truth. <laughs> that is true. One party, one party says now just lies about everything all the time. And... Uh, that's that's pretty true. When when Trump says something good by like, why can't we be friendly with Russia? Does he have the support of any, practically anybody else in the Republican Party? No, nor of the Democratic Party. <laughs> it has to be said. But uh, I think the chances are distinctly better, less bad with Democrats. Yeah. All right. So if you're listening to this, you yeah, vote and read this book by Daniel Ellsberg. It's called Doomsday Machine: Confessions of Nuclear War Planner. And you know write your congressman or senator and show up at their town halls and ask them, why have they not read this book? Because this is one of the... I'll hand biggest... them the book because that, that'll that work much better apparently than sending it to them in their congressional offices where it'll never get to them. Yes, uh, have an extra copy of the book to hand to your congressional representative. That's a great idea. <laughs> okay, great. So unfortunately, we're all out of time. So I think we're going to have to wrap things up there. Uh, but we've been speaking with Daniel Ellsberg. So, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Your questions are terrific. Thank you. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Daniel Ellsberg for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Ben Thompson, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to Toto Films, who just made a very generous contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Casper for sponsoring today's show. Remember that you can get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash galaxy and using the promo code galaxy at checkout. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.